Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijspers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, I want to take a look at a, for me, fascinating subject in the philosophy of physics, although the physics that we are going to need is going to be extremely minimal. The topic is the nature of velocity or instantaneous velocity. And we're going to think about that by looking at Frank Arnsenius's 2000 article, Are There Really Instantaneous Velocities? And what Arnsenius is going to do in this, in this paper is he's going to think through this idea of instantaneous velocities. He's going to present three theories that try to make sense of it. And he is going to tell us that all three theories are in trouble. And so it's, a, in that sense, a rather negative paper. It doesn't solve the problem. It just puts the problem on the table. And perhaps unsurprisingly, it has led to a lot of discussion. So are there really instantaneous velocities? So what are instantaneous velocities? Let's get a sort of pre-theoretical grip on that. Well, we all know about the idea of velocity. And when we think of velocities, we can either be thinking about average velocities or instantaneous velocities. And so an average velocity, well, for instance, if I start walking now and I walk for one hour and at the end of the hour, I am five kilometers from my current position, then my average velocity was five kilometers per hour, right? If in an hour I get five kilometers from my starting point, I walked at five kilometers per hour on average. But of course, that doesn't mean that I've been walking with the same speed at every moment of that hour. Right? Maybe I started out more slowly and I sped up as I went, or maybe I started out with a higher speed and I slowed down as I went on. Uh, or maybe it was some strange curve, right? Where I speed up and slow down many times. And so it makes sense not just to ask about my average velocity over the hour, but also to ask for each point of time what my velocity at that time was. Right? And so I can say, well, at that point of time, I was walking with four kilometers per hour. At that other point of time, I was walking at six kilometers per hour and so on. That would be an instantaneous velocity. And if you've ever done any, any high school physics even, um, you know, instantaneous velocity is what you are talking about most of the time, really. If you think of a mechanical system, if you try to tell the state of a mechanical system, right, you're trying to tell, well, what's going on? Uh, right now, like for instance, what is the initial state, like the beginning state of our system, you would have to give us all the objects, you would have to tell us where they are, their positions, uh, you would have to tell us maybe their masses or charges or whatever else is relevant, uh, but you also have to tell us their velocities, right, their instantaneous velocities at that time. If you don't do that, if you tell me, okay, look, there are these two balls, both of them weigh one kilogram, one is here, one is over there, one meter between them. What's going to happen next? There's no way for me to tell you what's going to happen next because I also need to know their velocities. I mean, are they moving toward each, towards each other? Are they moving away from each other? Are they standing still? Are they moving in this way or that way? I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities. And unless you give me not just their positions, but also their velocities, there's nothing I can do as a physicist, right? I mean, I can't really calculate anything. So we are very familiar with the idea of an instantaneous velocity, and it seems that if a physicist describes a physical system, they're going to use velocities to do that. So where is the philosophical puzzle? I mean, why would anyone ask, are there really instantaneous velocities? Well, Arnsenius um, brings in the puzzle through Zeno's paradox of the arrow. And most later articles reacting to Arnsenius don't really go through the Zeno's arrow, but it's, it's fun, it's nice to uh, bring it in. So let's do that. So Zeno of Aleia was an ancient Greek philosopher, usually called a pre-Socratic, but he was actually more or less a contemporary of Socrates. And he was the uh, follower of Parmenides, who famously claimed that change is impossible. And Zeno is well known for some paradoxes that seem to show that change is impossible, and the paradox of the arrow is one of them. Okay, says Zeno, think of an arrow in flight, right? But now take it at one moment. So at that one moment, is it moving? Well, no, if it were moving at that one moment, it would have to be in two different positions at one moment. That's impossible, right? The arrow can only be in one position at that moment. 
Okay, so in that moment, it's not moving. In that moment, it's identical to an arrow that is standing still. All right, but that's true for every moment, right? At every moment, the arrow isn't moving. And so it's never moving. And so movement is impossible. Well, maybe that's the conclusion that Zeno actually wanted to draw, right? The claim that all movement, all change is illusion. It's not really possible. Um, but that's not really a conclusion that a lot of other philosophers have wanted to embrace. So other philosophers have usually seen it as their task to explain to us where Zeno's reasoning goes wrong. And Arnsenius gives us three ways of doing that. And as I said, what he's going to do in the article, he's going to look at all three ways and he's going to claim that all three ways are problematic. And he is not going to conclude that Zeno was right, but he is going to conclude that we need to do more work and think more about this. All right, what are the three ways? I'm just going to read out from the abstract of Arnsenius's article. So here's the first way. It's the at-at theory, according to which there is no such thing as instantaneous velocity, while motion in the sense of the occupation of different locations at different times is possible. So the at-at theory is going to say that in some sense, there is no such thing as instantaneous velocity. I think it's a little dubious to phrase it that way, and I'll explain why later, but that's, that's the basic idea. Um, but there's nevertheless movement, there's nevertheless velocity, because velocity is nothing else than being at different places at different times. So that's the ad ad theory. The second option is the impetus theory, according to which instantaneous velocities do exist, but these are only contingently and causally related to the temporal developments of position. So here there are instantaneous velocities, and they have to be linked with changes in position through something that Arnsenius tells us is contingent and causal. And again, I think that that's maybe not quite the right way to phrase it. And again, I will tell you why later. And then there's the third possibility, which is the no instance theory, according to which instants in time do not exist. And hence instantaneous velocities do not exist, while motion in the sense of different areas occupied during different time intervals is possible. So the third, the no instance view tells us that there are no instants. And of course you don't have Zeno's paradox of the arrow if there are no instants. That might actually have been uh, Aristotle's answer, the no instance view. I mean, he tells us um, that like time doesn't really exist of infinitely many points. Like time is divisible in the sense that we can always look at a smaller time, but we never sort of reach these instants. And so he doesn't think that time consists of instants. Okay, so let's follow Arnsenius in looking at the at at theory first. So what is the at at theory of motion? It's sometimes um, coupled to the name of Bertrand Russell, the early 20th century philosopher, uh, although there were also medieval philosophers who worked out this idea. So the at at theory of motion is basically the claim that velocity is not some kind of primitive or fundamental property that things have. Uh, really, fundamentally in the world, there's just position. Well, I mean, and mass, and, and but not velocity. There's just different positions at different times. And if we have different positions at different times, then we have velocities, right? Because, well, average velocity is just the difference in position divided by the difference in time. And then if we take the limit of making this time interval zero, well, the limit towards zero. Um, so if we take what in, uh, in mathematics is called the derivative of position to time, the time derivative of position, I think that's the correct phrase. If we take the time derivative of position, then we get the velocity. That just is what velocity is, right? A velocity just is being at different positions at different times and we can get an instantaneous velocity or something like an instantaneous velocity by taking this limit, this derivative um, of the position to time. So that is actually a way of talking about velocities that makes a lot of sense from the perspective of a physicist, right? I mean, 
What is velocity? Well, it is, the physicist would say, dx dt, right? It is the derivative of position to time, the time derivative of position. That's what velocity is, according to the ad ad theory. And so it doesn't make sense to say that objects have positions and velocities. They are just at different positions at different times. That's the reality. And then we can calculate what the velocity is, but it's not some extra ingredient in our ontology. It's not some extra thing in the world. So that sounds pretty sensible. Um, why would anyone have a problem with that? Well, here's one worry we could have about that. Um, and it's a worry that, that for Arsenius is very important. We could have the worry that if we accept the ad ad theory of velocity, then the world is no longer Markovian. Now, in order to understand what this problem is supposed to be, we need to know what Markovian means. So a world would be Markovian if any causal effects of the past have to go through the present to the future. So if you exactly know what the present is, then you have all the causal information you could possibly get about what's going to happen in the future. There's no causes in the past that can have an effect on the future, which isn't there in the past, right? So it's not the case that something that I did yesterday, it has like, there's no traces of it now. It's just there yesterday. And then tomorrow it's suddenly going to cause something. Right? That would be causation at a temporal distance. You do something, it has no effect right now, and then after a while, suddenly it has an effect. We usually don't think that the world works like that, and our physical theories don't think that the world works like that. Right? Our physical theories are such that if you know the state of the world at one moment, then you have all the information you could get about what happens later. And it's not the case that you also need to have the history of the world because this history is going to sort of jump over the present, so to speak, and, and have some effect in the future. Okay, so Arsenius thinks it's important, or it's at least desirable, that we keep the world Markovian. But if velocities are not really properties of objects, if there are just positions, then if you give me the state of the world right now, what you give me is just the positions of the objects, right? And not their velocities, because their velocities are not something additionally in our ontology. It's not, it's not real, it's not there. There are just the positions. Uh, so you give me all the positions of the objects and that's not enough as we already saw. You can't do physics with that. You're leaving out causally important information. And so you also need to give me the past. Now, Arnsenius is well aware that you don't need to give me the entire past. You only need to give me a very small part of the past. In fact, any part of the past that you give me is already too big. You could always give me a smaller part of the past because velocities are limit properties, right? If you give me one second of the past, yeah, that's enough for me to calculate the velocity here, but you could also have given me half a second or a quarter of a second or an eighth of a second or a sixteenth of a second or, you know, you can go smaller and smaller. Whatever you give me, it's always too much. So what you really need to do is you need to give me any neighborhood, any temporal neighborhood, as a mathematician might call it, a neighborhood around the present or before the present. That's enough. And so Arnsenius calls velocity a neighborhood property. And he says, well, you know, I mean, mathematically, of course, all of that works. Um, but we can worry, we can still worry about the fact that the world in this way is not Markovian. And for him, the problem is especially acute in that he says, look, and I'll, I'll read out what he says on page 195. He says, surely our notion of a physical state is such that being in a particular physical state at some time does not by definition and logic alone put any constraints on what physical states the system can be in at other times. Physics may impose constraints on the possible developments of the physical state of a system, but surely logic and definition by itself could not do so. 
And that implies that neighborhood properties and neighborhood states are not physical states. They are features of finite developments of physical states. So here's what Arnsadius is saying. Suppose that I tell you that the velocity of this pencil at this moment, t is zero, is zero. Right, so I'm telling you something about t is zero. Well, if the velocity at t is zero is zero, then you know something about what happens before and after t is zero, right? In this neighborhood around t is zero, you know that the object, if you make the neighborhood smaller and smaller and smaller, you're getting to a point where it's, it's, it's not moving, where the derivative is going to be zero, right? The derivative of the position to time is going to be zero in this neighborhood if you take the limit because that's what velocity is. So by telling you something about the present, by telling you this property of zero velocity, I'm implying something logically about the moments that come before the present. And that is something that Arntanius thinks is impossible. He thinks it can't be the case that logic tells us what can happen before or after the present. Right? If I give you a physical instantaneous state, then maybe the laws of physics can tell you what's going to happen before or after that, but logic or definition alone cannot. That's Ansenius's claim. I'm not sure how serious that problem is. And if you look at articles written after Ansenius, there are definitely people who claim that this is not such a big problem, right? Maybe we just need to accept these neighborhood properties uh, and we need to accept that they, yeah, I mean, in a sense, show a kind of logical relation between, between instants. Um, why not? But Ansenius thinks that this is a real problem. Personally, I'm a little bit more worried about something that um, that Ansadius also mentions, though more briefly, which is the idea of the explanatory relation between velocity and position. Right, usually we think that velocities explain changes in position. Right, if I have to explain why it took the train an hour to get from Utrecht to Leiden, I can tell you that, well, it, it moved a lot slower than normally, right? Because normally it takes only 40 minutes. So it moved a lot slower than normally. So it seems that I can bring in the velocity to explain the change in position over time. But if the at at theory is right, that's getting things completely the wrong way around, right? It's the positions at different times that explain the velocity, not the other way around. And so the at at theory you know, seems to be a little bit hard to reconcile with our idea that velocity explains or maybe causes change in position rather than changes in position being what explains the velocity that something has. Okay, putting that there for your consideration. Let's look at the second theory. And the second theory is the impetus theory. So the basic idea of the impetus theory is just that you can add velocity as a property of objects, instantaneous velocity. So objects have a position, they also have a velocity. That's it. Uh, this immediately solves this explanation problem, right? You can explain why something moves because there is this extra thing that objects have, which is velocity. But of course, it only explains the change in movement if I, if I, you know, draw a relation between velocity and position. And of course, the relation is going to have to be the exact same relation as the relation that the at at theorist was positing, right? We have to say also as an impetus theorist that velocity is equal to the time derivative of position. I mean, if you don't say that, I don't know what you're talking about, but it's not velocity. And so Arnsenius is going to worry about two things here. The first thing he's going to worry about is that velocity seems to be kind of a needless addition to our ontology, right? He says, look, if I already have positions at times, that's enough to define velocity. So now you bring in velocity as some extra thing. Why is that legitimate? Shouldn't we use Occam's razor and say that we don't need the velocities? I'm not sure that that's a very strong argument myself. I think Occam's razor, it's, it's really hard to use it well. 
I mean, Occam's razor tells you to get rid of needless things. Well, if I'm an impetus theorist, I don't think that these velocities are needless. I think they are needed to explain the changes in position. So I'm not sure how strong that is, but um, Arnsenius thinks it's strong and he's certainly not the only one who, who brings in that kind of argument, saying that, well, if you already have positions, you shouldn't add velocities as something extra. Uh, the other worry that we might have is that, okay, how are velocities then connected to positions? Right, okay, so we need this formula that velocity is the time derivative of position. But what's its status? Right, it's not the definition of velocity because velocity is something extra, some extra property that an object has. So maybe it's a law of nature, right? It's just something like uh, the law of gravity, for instance. Well, and then Arsenius can, can raise, you know, the worry that this is in a sense rather strange, right? I mean, the law of gravity, it's something that we have to find out about empirically. It's something of which we might think that it could have been different. I mean, couldn't there be worlds without gravity, for instance, or where gravity works in a different way? But neither of these seems to be true about velocity. I mean, we don't have to empirically find out how velocity and changes in position are related. I mean, we measure changes in positions and that's the velocity. We, we didn't like investigate a relation between them. And it would seem, I mean, Arsenius takes this possibility seriously, but I, for me, find it extremely hard to understand what could be meant by a world in which velocity is not the time derivative of position. So objects have a velocity, but it does something else. I mean, how could that be velocity? So there are some questions to be asked here too. I'll come out and say that I really like the impetus theory, uh, but you have to do some work. Right? As an impetus theorist, you will have to explain how velocity and position can be related without making velocity just redundant. And that might not be easy. So that's the impetus theory. The final theory uh, would be a theory that just rejects the idea that there are points of time, that there are these instants. As I said, Aristotle claims that although you can divide time potentially but you can look, if you want to, at smaller and smaller pieces of time as long as you want. Um, that doesn't mean that time is actually infinitely divided. It doesn't mean that there are actual instants of time. And so you might just reject Zeno's story. Now, if you're a modern day physicist or a modern day philosopher of physics, uh, you will have to contend with the fact that standard physics is formulated in terms of a mathematics that actually postulates infinitely many instants, right? We do mathematics on the real number line and the real number line or real number Euclidean space or whatever uh, has infinitely many points. I mean, there just are these instants of time in our physics. And so you will maybe have to reformulate physics. And there are people who try to do this. There are people who try to um, tell us how a point, what a pointless geometry might be like. Right, so a geometry which has finite areas, uh, but no points, right? finite intervals, but no points. And it can be done. I mean, it's mathematically possible, uh, but if you want to use it, uh, or if we want to explain what it means or how to connect it to, to experiments and to our usual concepts and so on, then Arnsenius points out, um, we find out that we really, you know, we need to explain the pointless geometry in terms of the normal geometry with points. So it's a lot more complicated. And in order to understand it, we still need to kind of think about points. So as a theory of what time really is, for instance, or how we should do physics, it doesn't seem very promising. It does, it's not a very natural way of trying to formulate our physical theories or of using our physical theories. And so again, Arnsenius thinks that this, this theory, it's not looking good. And so that's Arnsenius' final conclusion. We have three responses to the paradox of the arrow, three ways of thinking about instantaneous velocities, and none of them is looking good. The at at theory simply defines velocity as change of position over time, as, as the time derivative of position. That's what an instantaneous velocity is. But it's not really instantaneous. It's a neighborhood property, and it seems to have these strange implications about 
maybe the causal role of velocity that is, or explanatory role of velocity. It's hard to see how that works. Uh, as well as this problem of Markovianism, where it seems that the past can bypass the present to cause something in the future. The impetus theory says, well, there's not just positions, there's also, as another primitive property, this idea of velocities. But that may seem like one property too many. Right? Positions, and at times, already give us velocities. So what do those velocities do that we add? And how are they connected to positions and changes of position? There are some serious questions there too. And finally, a pointless geometry. We could apply that to time to get rid of all instants, but it's very unnatural, it's very complicated. It's hard to see how to work with it, except by actually really working with points and then sort of throwing a, a source of pointless geometry over it and saying, yeah, yeah, okay, we talk about points, but we really mean this pointless geometry. So that doesn't seem like a very profitable way of thinking about physics either. As I said, there's an entire literature based on or, or reacting to Arsenius's article. Um, and since, it's a, since this is a topic that I'm working on myself at the moment, I might do some more, uh, some more of those papers. Uh, but at least for now, we've gotten some insight into what the discussion is and what some of the possible avenues of research or possible ways of arguing about time and velocity are.